Well, good morning there, Dr. Robert Lover. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Gareth, thanks for the invitation. I, I thought I didn't even ask what time it is there, but you're you're early afternoon, I'm gonna assume. Yeah, we're we're one o'clock here and uh it's uh, it's baking, like I was saying before we started. So <laughs> if I have sweat that starts dripping down my face, you'll you'll know why. But um, no, no worries. I I live in a climate where our summertime gets hot and humid too. So uh, we'll, we'll 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 have empathy for each other. <laughs> Thanks so much, Matt. Um, so Alex Moore is a, a good mate of mine, and um, mm-hmm. he is obviously a guy that uh, that you work with, and you guys have a, a coaching um, group together called Integrated Nation. And um, he, for a long time, I've been watching him on Insta and he's talking, he's been talking about Mr. Nice Guy. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting, you know, like, or no more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm like, hmm, that's even more interesting, you know. <laughs> and then uh, I, I follow uh, Chris Williamson and, and I saw that you were on there recently. And then I listened to the whole podcast and then I, I messaged, messaged Alex and I was like, hey, this is your man, isn't it? And he's like, yeah. I was like, wow. What a great conversation. I'd love to be able to, to speak to him. And so thanks so much to Alex for, for putting us in touch and, and for you to, for, gen, for you know, generously accepting this, um, this invitation. It, it means a lot to me. So thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. I, I, I enjoy doing this kind of stuff and I know we'll have a good time. Cool. So Alex, he speaks um, super highly of you. He's like, you know, I speak to uh, Dr. Glover almost I, every day. I, 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 pay, I pay him to do that. Yeah, I pay, I, <laughs> but, nobody, but he, nobody would ever speak highly of me if I didn't bribe them. I, I, I doubt that. Um, you obviously have a big influence on him, and and he he says you know you're like a, a bit of a father figure to him. Um, so I was wondering, how do you guys actually know each other? Well, the reason I assume well the story he tells is that um, I think he must have found my book, No More Mister Nice Guy, and maybe it he'd start reading it or working through it. And he was a, a, a member, I think of a couple of like membership men's membership programs. And, and I think it might've happened that I got invited to speak on at least one or maybe both of these programs that he's in, or, or it might he, he even told him maybe he even signed up for the program. Cause he was going to hear that they're going to interview me. So then, um, you know, he of course is in New Zealand, originally from the U S I'm originally from the U S living in Mexico. And um, he did a, a workshop with me to become a certified coach, a normal Mr. Nice Guy certified coach, and then um, stayed in touch. I always liked his energy. And and um, when I started putting together uh, what is now called Integration Nation, over two years ago, I reached out to some of my certified coaches uh, that I thought would be a good asset to help me put the the put this program together. And he was one of the people that came to mind. And I was also looking for some you know, worldwide diversity as well. And uh, so, yeah, Alex has been working with me in Integration Nation, one of my certified coaches. And, um, you know, I, I I guess because of my age or maybe just because I, I give a lot of maybe fatherly advice, um, a, a lot of men uh, will say that, you know, I'm a mentor to them or, or a father figure that they never had. And, you know, I take that as a compliment because um, most men I work with, don't necessarily, you know, have a good image of the word father because maybe their fathers were less than ideal. So um, I, I, I like knowing that I can play that role, that I, I can fill that, that father role in a good way for a lot of men. And, and sounds like Alex is one of them. Absolutely. I think that says a lot about like both of you. I always think your energy says a lot about you, you know, and it's, uh, you know, obviously he had good energy and you right. did too. And that's why you sort of gravitated towards each other. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> I'll say, okay, <laughs> we both have good energy. I'll, ta- I'll take your word on that. <laughs> good um, stuff. Yeah, you know, you, well, you know, you just, you just click with certain people. And like when I was um, trying to decide which of my coaches to invite to help me put together what, uh, yeah, I, I, I want this to be, you know, the world's largest program for men I, you know it's not an ego thing i just want every man in the world who wants to be in a men's program to have access so i started to think who who do i want to work with and who might want might i want to work with for a few years right because i thought you know this isn't you know i'm, I'm 68 now i was about 65 when i started working on it so you know uh, i'm not gonna be around forever but if i'm gonna start something like this in my 60s i better be committed to stick around and see it through so you know i just started asking myself who, who could i work well with who can I communicate with? Who's a team player? Who has a good energy? Um, 
and 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 who was already coaching and who believes in hustle, you know, getting out and, and you know, uh, working, working for it. And he was one of the people that came to mind. So, yeah, I would say even all seven of these men that I brought in to help me build Integration Nation, um, all very different, all around the world, uh, different races, nationalities, diversity of religions. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't intentionally look go looking for that kind of diversity, but it came together. But they were all guys that I felt that kind of connection with in very different ways. Every, every man that, that, that I did this with, I felt a different connection. But in every case, kind of go back to the way you put it, there, there was, a, it was a connection that I felt there. And I thought I could work with this person. I, I, I could have them in my life, you know, in this close working relationship for a number of years and, and not regret it. And and so far, I haven't regretted any of those choices. And there are all seven of those guys who are still hanging in there and working with me about two, two and a half years after we started. Um, so I, I guess I chose well, or I got lucky, one of the two. <laughs> so you have uh, two degrees in religion and a PhD in psychology or family therapy. Yeah, marriage and family therapy. How did that transpire into you becoming the GOAT? of helping men. <laughs> I, I love it when I get called the goat because mainly I always have to go look it up what what, what goat stands for. Uh, but but I know it's always a term of endearment. Um, so yeah, that story when, um, I, I, I don't know what your experience was as a young man, but you know, usually around, you know, you, you, like your junior year of high school, you know, you're about 16, 17 years old people start saying, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Like, who knows what they're going to do when they're 16 years old? But, you know, there's this pressure that, well, I got, I got to make choices. Am, am I going to go to college? A am I going to, you know, travel? Am I going to get a job? What, what do I want to do? You know, nowadays it's easy for young men. You know, everybody, every young guy growing up now just wants to be a, a, a entrepreneur and a, a, a nomad and build click funnels and sell shit on the internet. That's what everybody grows up to do nowadays. But, you know, back in the, in the day, you know, those options didn't exist. And so, you know, around 16, 17 years old, I started, what do I want to do? Um, you know, my father was a mailman, worked for the post office. And you know, when I was little, I said, well, I want to be a mailman when I grow up, you know, but my, my father did a pretty good job of <laughs> trying to divert me from that path. And he said, no, you're going to go to college. You don't, you, you know, I don't want you to have to work as hard as I did. And, um, but he, but because he'd never been to college, he had absolutely um, no, no real ability that wave goodbye to my wife taking off. So he had no real ability really into how to prepare me or direct me to that. Luckily I, I was in a good school system and got a, got a good education. And um, so I started thinking, well, what do I want to do? If I go to college, what do I want to do? And I, I, I grew up in a, a fundamental Christian church, and I was that was kind of a main part of my social life, was just you know going to church, and my friends were there, and going to summer camp, and, and things like that. And I thought, well, you know, I always liked history, you know, so I, I kind of liked studying biblical history, and I always liked being social. And about my, my junior year in high school, I joined uh, the debate team because my older sister had been in it. And uh, found out that, oh, okay, I kind of like this public speaking thing and um, got pretty good at that and had good success in debate and, and extemporaneous speaking and impromptu. And um, thought, okay, you know, I, I kind of like standing up in front of people and communicating. So I thought, well, I'll be a minister. Now, you know, I, I don't know that I felt necessarily all that religious. Um, I mean, I went to church regularly, but mainly just because that's where, where my friends were. Um, and, you know, I tried to be a good person. You know, I, I was a nice guy trying to do things right. So I thought, well, okay, you know, I, I like, I like history, you know, and, and I'm pretty good speaking in front of people and, and, you know, and so I, thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go to study and be a minister. Got to college, Christian college, first semester, first class, psychology 101. And, uh, I take that class and just like, I love this stuff. You know, this, it, 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 that really got me excited. So the, I was able to go into a program that, that w had both, you know, religion and ministry aspects along with psychology. So I, I basically, you know, got a minor in psychology with that. And then and realized, well, I want to work, I think I want to work with, you know, marriage and family. And, and, you know, looking back on it, I was probably trying to fix my parents' marriage. You know, they, they stayed married till my dad died about 12, 13 years ago, but um, it, it was, 
relatively dysfunctional relationship. And, um, and I think there's probably like a lot of people that either go into ministry or counseling or social work. I want to help people, i.e. I want to fix mom and dad. Um, so that's probably what I was doing. So um, it's funny, when I was in high school, I didn't really want to go to college. I didn't enjoy school that much in, in high school until to, to about my last two years. Um, then when I went to college, oh, well, that's that's all I'm going to do. But I got done with college and I thought, well, if I want to, you know, really help people, I probably should go get a master's degree. So I got I got some scholarships. So, OK, I'll go work on a master's degree. By the time I got a master's degree, I thought, well, if I really want to help people, I probably should get a Ph.D. So the, the first two degrees were, were religion oriented. And then the, my Ph.D. was in marriage and family therapy. And then I, I, I worked as a minister for probably about eight years and then all the while really wanting to focus on um, working primarily with relationships and, and whether that was, you know, doing therapy courses, things like that. So that's kind of how I evolved in that path. And then when, when I left the ministry, uh, my early thirties, um, I, I went, I went looking, I I'd kind of gotten burned out on the fundamental Christianity stuff. Cause I never really bought kind of the whole literal interpretation of the Bible and, you know, God's this angry God that wants to cast us into hell for all eternity and you better get it right. Or, you know, you're, you're toast. I, I never really bought that. It's just what I grew up with. So it was familiar. So I started looking for, you know, other churches and, um, you know, I, I tried out kind of the, 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 the evangelical churches and they're all waving their hands singing glory to God, glory to God. And I got, I think I need a little more depth than that. And then I went to like the new age churches that, you know, all about just, you know, everything is everything and everything is goodness. And yeah, after I heard about free sermons, it's like I'd heard them, heard the same sermon every time I went, I thought, I think I need a little more depth than that. So I tried some of the traditional, you know, you know, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopal, and I got, oh, that's just way too much ceremony. And, and about the only thing I really found that I thought, oh, I can connect with this was 12 step programs. Um, and, and, you know, I thought, well, they're, they're kind of doing what I think, you know, what the mission of the early church was, is it wasn't supposed to be a museum for saints, it's a hospital for sinners. You know, where do you go and just acknowledge, I, I'm broken, you know, I, 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 I need to find a new way to operate in the world. So 12 steps kind of became that answer. And then I got into therapy and groups. And so I started, I think, finding a lot of what I needed just by, by doing, I guess, for lack of a better term, personal growth, personal development type activities. So um, I, I, I've said for many years now that I don't consider myself religious, um, but I'm still on some kind of spiritual journey that I, I don't know. I don't know many answers. I don't know where it's going to end up, you know, if it ends up anywhere else than it is right now. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm open to just, you know, uh, I'm an I don't know her. I don't know what's out there, but but I do know that, you know, there's something pretty amazing out there. And maybe it's not even out there. Maybe it's here. So, I say so anyway, was that was that more than what you were looking for, or was that exactly what you were looking for? That's exactly what I was looking for. It's nice to sort of find out how people get to where they get. And I think we're, you know, as men, very, you know, happy that you decided to choose what you did choose. And 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 it's not like you didn't give it a good go in the church, you know. So you can't yeah. say that you just gave up easily. That's for sure. <laughs> no, and, and, and you know, I I think basically where I'm at in life right now has, for the most part, chosen me. Um, and 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 I I I kind of tend to speak at things like that. You know, I, I mentioned letting my dog, and she's sitting right down here at my feet. And you know, she chose us. This house that that I'm in down here in Mexico, it chose me. You know, my I, I've been I'd, I'd lost two different leases over a couple of years on condos. I was in. I thought, you know, I need to find something, and I didn't know what. I was looking for land or a condo or a house, and my my then girlfriend, now my wife, you know told me one night, I said, I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know how to help you. We look at all these places, but I go, I don't know. And then the very next day we walked through this house and it's, you know, two story, got five bathrooms, a swimming pool, Mexican traditional style. It was completely empty. And, and well, I didn't say a word and we got out front and my wife says, you love it, don't you? I said, I'm going to buy this house. I had no idea I was going to buy it. I didn't have the money, but I bought it and paid it off in three years. And um, so almost you know, everything in my life, whether it's the art around me, whether it's, you know, ending up on your podcast, you know, this stuff just, it just finds me. And um, I, 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 I haven't gone looking for anything in a long time. I just, stuff just keeps finding me. 
And I keep saying yes to it. So that's kind of been been a, a mantra. I, I have a, a dear friend passed away a few years ago. Um, as a gay couple lived down here in Puerto Vallarta and ran a bed and breakfast. And I, I, I stayed there once and became friends and they threw the biggest parties and and um, but but uh, Ernie, the, he was from Germany originally, and he used to tell great stories. And they both passed away now. But but Ernie, this old guy, used to say, he "says sin to say no when you should have said yes." And then he goes, "A mortal sin to say no when you should have said yes." And you know, as a, as a nice guy, I'm always, well, I don't know if I could take that risk. Well, I don't know if I should do that. I don't. And I just flipped that and just started saying yes. You know, if 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 something grabbed my attention, a, a piece of art this house, this dog, the, my wife, I was walking down a street in Puerto Vallarta and I heard a voice that said, hola, senor, want a massage? And I, and I didn't even look. I said, no, I, mañana, you know, not today, tomorrow. Kept walking and I thought, I liked her voice. That's it. I just liked her voice. My, a friend of mine had said, Robert, you need to start paying more attention to your emotional connect and not just your head. I, okay. I like her voice. Went back, got a massage. Six months later, she asked me out. And I said, well, let me ask you out. And we've been married seven and a half years now. So I just I said yes, right? I was walking down the street and a voice says all the time, I don't know how it is where you live, but I live in a tourist town. So, you know, everywhere you go, you know, they're trying to get tourists to come into their store. You know, so everywhere you go, want a massage, want a massage, and uh, want a tattoo, want a tattoo, you know, stuff like that. So, I, you know, I just keep saying yes and interesting stuff keeps finding me. Well, that could be one of the best yeses you've ever said. So I'm, I'm glad that you did that. And you now have this uh, beautiful, awesome wife, wife. Uh, I was just wondering this last weekend, uh, you held a couple of webinars and you had a thing called AMA, which is ask me anything. I right. was wondering what was the best question you got asked? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> last weekend. Let's see. I got to think back. Cause, um, yeah, I did one for to promote uh, the Big Stick, uh, a book that that uh, uh, one of my coaches, another one of my coaches, co co wrote with me, and had just come out in Audible last month. So we did a promotion of that, and we did a promotion for my course on uh, All the Way In, and um, the, <laughs> I'll brag in my brain for what was the best question. I, I took a screenshot of my week this week uh, off my calendar to share with a couple of friends, and everything that was in, in red. Uh, was when I was on Zoom. And like last this last Tuesday, today's Friday, you and I are talking. I was on Zoom for nine and a half hours Tuesday. You know, from interviews to client calls to talking to some of my coaches. Um, and so my week has been like that. And then, you know, you contact me this week, you know, you want to do an interview? And I go, all right, I think I can squeeze you in Friday for two hours, so Friday morning. So, I don't even hardly remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> little, so I've, little, I've got a question what for was you the, then. What was the best question I got last weekend? If if, if something comes up uh, well, during the, our time talking, I'll go, oh, wait, 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 wait. I, I remember it now. So uh, I'll, okay. I'll take whatever, whatever your question is. Let's go with that. Okay. Yeah. What is a man's highest purpose? Oh, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I know people like to, you know, guys will ask me, kind of that kind of question what is a man what's a man's highest purpose uh I, I don't know i don't know i really don't um i I'm, I'm not even sure i know what my highest purpose is what i'm beginning you know i mentioned kind of the spiritual journey um it seems like to kind of just back up a little bit about about six years ago um right around well six years ago i i got really sick and um, nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. Went to doctors down here in Mexico, up in the States. And, you know, I got misdiagnosed, you know, you know, you got an ulcer or you got colitis or you got this. And I was having really bad stomach cramps constantly. And I got to where I could hardly eat. And I was in pain all the time and couldn't shit and couldn't sleep. And and um, this went on for three months and I lost over 30 pounds. And I, I was pretty sure I was dying. I thought maybe this is old age, old age sucks, but I think I'm, think I'm dying. I didn't know what, and like a doctor, a gastroenterologist in the state said, well, maybe you just got a Mexican bug and you got to outlive it. Well, I, I wasn't going to outlive it. I went to acupuncture. I mean, I, so many things. And finally, uh, the right doctor, which just through, again, he found us the right doctor, um, did the right test and said, well, you have, you have a, a, a 
oh, a tumor blocking your small intestine. We need to take it out right now. And I said, uh, give me 48 hours. Let me go home, hide the porn. You know, I can't, can't, uh, no, I, I had to, I had to get everything in order in case I don't know. I'm going into a Mexican hospital and somebody's going to cut into my small intestine. Um, so, and it went well, you know, two, two weeks later, I got on an airplane and flew to Seattle and did a workshop. So I, I survived well from that, but you know, it really, it really hit me that, um, you know, death, death is there. It's real. And then that, and that, you know, so maybe even just kind of thinking out loud of your question, what's our highest purpose? Maybe it's to prepare for death. Um, because um, uh, Carlos Castaneda says, keep death right here at, at, at your left side at, at all times. Um, I was trying to think of, of the quote last night from Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. And, and he says, all crea creativity involves a dance with death. Remember, remember reading, I, I, I read. Slaughterhouse Five again a couple months ago or a few months ago. I read it in high school. So there's been this pattern that every book that got recommended to me, whether it's fiction book, uh, nonfiction, as I'm reading them over the last few couple of years, they've all, in one way or another, been about death, the reality of death. But woven in there is also it also seems like there's often a story of fate, that that this is a person's this whatever the story was, even nonfiction books. I'm reading like nonfiction books. I read a book about baseball and all of a sudden the guy's daughter dies and I'm just bawling. I don't even know the guy. It's a you know, true story. And, and so I've really been playing with this idea around fate. And if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, did I believe in fate? I'd say, yeah, probably not. Um, and maybe it's just because every fiction writer maybe believes in fate because we think about it. A fiction book, the writer knows the fate of everybody in it, you know. So maybe, maybe by nature, fiction writers believe in fate. Um, so I've been playing with that idea of, of fate, and maybe that ties in with your question: What's my purpose? And I'm wondering if my fate is to just keep saying yes to these doors that open in front of me, because there's this beautiful, elegant path, and maybe there's maybe there's many elegant paths. That if I say yes to this, I go down this beautiful, elegant path. That is my fate. Or maybe if I'd said yes to, if I, you know, maybe if I, if I had never gone back and said yes to, to my wife for a massage, maybe I still would, maybe it wouldn't be the identical path that this one took. It couldn't be. I mean, but maybe it was still a fate that doors were going to continue. Now, down that path, these doors are going to open that that i can keep saying yes to and so there's there maybe maybe there's multiple fates but maybe in all of those that there's maybe some underlying theme that that is in there and so maybe my purpose is to just keep saying yes and um and having a mind of curiosity and and um, excitement to go i don't know where this is leading you know, I decided to start a men's membership program. I, I, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. And the further I got into it, I thought, I have to treat this as if this is my fate. Otherwise, it'll be too tempting to bail. Because, again, in my late 60s now, it's a lot of hard work. I've never worked this hard in my entire life. I, I got a PhD at 29, so I've worked hard at things, right? I've written books. I've written four books. I've worked hard at things. I'm learning language. I'm learning a new, my wife doesn't speak English, you know, so I'm learning Spanish in my 50s and 60s. So I'm up for challenge, but like, all right, if I'm going to do this, I got to treat it as if it is my fate, is what I'm supposed to be doing, is why I'm here, is my mission. And and I can't even, I can't even, because I, I, I've tried, I can't even put exactly in terms what exactly is that mission, but I know I'm on one. And the closest I've come to it, kind of going back to maybe even the fate story, um, about seven years ago, I was feeling really isolated down here in Mexico. My wife and I just got married. Again, you know, I, I, Spanish is not my first language. Didn't, you know, when I was single, living over in a more tourist part of town, I had a lot of friends there, mostly gay friends, but, you know, a lot of friends. Then when I get married and moved to kind of more of this house, this residential area, I, I'm just not, you know, around those people and, and and a lot of the people are pretty transient anyway coming and going uh, for a tourist town and, and so 
I, I, I started telling guys in my workshops, I need a men's program. I need a men's group. And one of the guys taking my workshops, well, I know this great, this men's program. I'm in it. This guy studied with David Data for 10 years and we have these retreats and we're, I'm in. So that same guy, one of my certified coaches as well, is a rabbi. On, on one of the first retreats I went to, we're out in the desert, Mojave Desert. And he gave us an assignment. And he says, go out in the desert and talk to God for 20 minutes. Talk out loud. Whatever your image, ideas of God, talk out loud to God for 20 minutes. And then be still and just listen for 20 minutes. Well, this is kind of cool. I'm out on the rock out in the middle of the desert talking to God. And I just got quiet. And, you know, I don't know what the voice of God sounds like. You know, is it that still small voice? Is it something that just draws your attention? Does, it, does, he, does he even have to use words? He, she, the cosmos, whatever this is I'm talking to. And um, just sitting there, we'll, we'll let the ambulance go by with the, the alarm <laughs> or the <laughs> siren. And um, I'm sitting there and, you know, kind of towards the end, I just had this thought. It came as a form of thought and it said, build a kingdom of love. And I had no idea what that meant. No idea what it meant. Like I said, recently bought this house. You know, when we bought it, my wife and I said, we want, we want it to be a place people can come and feel love and, and have a good experience. It's a great entertaining home. And I thought, well, okay, maybe that's it. Maybe I oh, just open my home, place of love. And many people have passed through here. Every, almost everybody I know says, Robert, I'm going to be in Puerto Vallarta. You want to get together? I said, come by. My wife will make us enchiladas. So a lot of people have come through. But it wasn't until I was maybe about a year into building Integration Nation that it kind of hit me. This might be the kingdom of love I was supposed to be building. So maybe if I say, if you ask me, Robert, what is your purpose? I think that's the best I got for you right now is to build a kingdom of love. What does that mean? What does it look like? I don't know that I fully know other than I just get up every day and um, and keep building, you know, this thing that's turning into a kingdom of love. So um, what's your purpose? I don't know. What's a man's purpose? I, I don't know. Um, I guess that's why we're all here is to, to figure that out. And uh, I wish I had a better answer for you. What, you know, oh, here's a man's purpose. I don't know. Maybe some people say, well, it's to provide and protect. Or it's to be this, it's to be that. I don't know. I think we're all here figuring stuff out. And uh, there's the, the beauty of life is that there's almost no answers and we just have to kind of go with the flow. Like you said, you know, things are often just fate. So let's let that happen. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful. And, and, and the other part of that fate is, is what I see it requires is faith. You know, I think a lot of people think of faith in, well, okay, you know, I, I, I read this holy book and, says have faith in this i think that's how most of us was christianity judaism islam hindu whatever hindu what i'm realizing is it takes a lot of faith to believe in your fate that this is what i'm supposed to be doing well, i gotta have faith that means i mean i i've invested x amount of money building this thing you know i'm, I'm getting up doing you know one morning this week i was up at 7 30 a.m doing an interview I'm doing your interview, you know, today. You know, I, I just keep having faith that the direction I'm going is the direction I'm supposed to be going. Now, how do we know? You don't. How do you know what the future holds? You don't. When I was six, six years ago, I didn't know I'd be alive, you know, talking to you today, you know, doing this. So I think there's a faith. Even, you know, guys come in. Well, yeah, let's, let's stick with this purpose thing for a minute. Guys will come to me and they'll say, you know, I, I, I got to find my purpose. I don't know what my purpose is. And, um, and I, said, well, I don't know what it is either. And I often ask them, have you been reading David Data? Yeah, I got to find my purpose. Because almost every guy that reads Way of the Superior Man, I got to find my purpose. And, and I go, okay, let's back up from that a little bit. Because, you know, David Data is talking about a karmic purpose. You know, so he, he believes, you know, we're, we're coming back here many times and, and living out some karmic path that we got to got to burn this karmic uh this karma to, in order to move forward so i don't i don't define purpose like oh it's that one thing that, that you're supposed to do like i said it, it, it might be a lot of, of of different stuff but one thing that really hit me just in the last month or two and going back to that faith thing for a man to live with purpose he's got to have faith that the actions he's taking 
are going to, to, to lead forward into a fuller experience of that purpose. I don't think you can live with purpose without faith. Because if you think about it, purpose involves a lot of walking through open doors into the unknown. You do not know what's on the other side of that. So, and that's why a lot of men don't have purpose, is that we're not comfortable living with faith. And, and at faith, I'm not talking about faith in some God that your religion told you about. I'm talking about a faith that if I take this action and I don't know what's on the other side, if you know what's on the other side of that action, no faith required, right? There's certainty. And, and so living purposefully requires a lot of leaps of faith that taking this action will be the perfect thing for me to be doing, however that turns out. And, and you know, I, I, I read a long time ago, there are no mistakes, only learning experiences. So if we have a faith that no matter what happens on the other side, if we can be outcome agnostic, equally okay with every possible outcome of taking that step forward, we can live purposefully. We can live passionately. And that's, again, why most men don't live purposefully or passionately is we're not willing to make leaps of faith into the unknown. Because the unknown scares the bejeebers out of us. I don't know what's out there. Um, kind of like every horror movie or every space movie. I don't know what's out there. And that scares us. So that requires faith. Can't think your way through it. Can't analyze your way through it. Can't line up all the ones and zeros and say, okay, I know that's the right decision. No, it doesn't work that way. I like that a lot. Um, I like people to think and realize that they are part of something bigger. Who knows what it is, but we're all living this life on planet Earth uh, without many answers, just probably lots of questions, but yeah. you are part of something bigger. So just believe in that and, you know, do whatever it is. Um, so that's really cool. But talking about love, you say that one of the greatest reasons of human suffering is people looking for external love. Sure. What, what do you mean by that? Okay. <laughs> we'll, hit on the, we'll hit on the big ones here. Let me even back that up a little bit further. Um, I got invited, got all the things to say yes to. I, I got invited a few years ago to go down to Costa Rica uh, to a place called Rhythmia, and it's a plant medicine retreat center. And the guy reached out to me, and I, I didn't know, and he said, but I've read your book. I love you. We're going to do a men's uh, week here. We want you to come be a guest speaker. I go, I've never done plant medicine. I've never done psychedelics. You know, I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s during the war on drugs. You know, if you take any drug, not only did I grow up with fundamental Christianity, you do one thing wrong, you go to hell for eternity. You know, I grew up with the war on drugs from the U.S. government. You take drugs, you're going to go crazy and jump off buildings and kill yourself, or you'll be an addict and in prison, you know. So anyway, uh, so I'd never done, you know, anything stronger than marijuana. And he said, well, come down and try it. I, okay. So I, had, I said, yes. You know, I, I tried to back out a number of ways. COVID even tried to back me out of it. They, it got pushed back a, a year because of COVID. So I, I, so I did go two years ago. I went again this year as well. They invited me back again. And, uh, but two years ago, I, we did four ceremonies with ayahuasca, with plant medicine. All my ceremonies were different. Uh, if, if you've done plant medicine, you, you know, don't try to tell people what your what your journeys were about, what your visions were. You can't. It's kind of like trying to describe, you know, God and heaven and eternity and the soul. You know, there's no words for all that stuff, but we keep trying anyway. Uh, like trying to describe what does a banana taste like to somebody who's never tasted a banana. Good luck. So, um, but but I had one ceremony, and really my main takeaway was that, is that we're all here to get our hearts broken. And with the basic premise that anything that is amazing enough to break our hearts is something we wouldn't have wanted to have missed. You know, and I often use the illustration of, of Nala, my, my pit bull down here at my feet. I love that dog dearly. Everybody loves Nala. Everybody that comes to our house, she says, she loves everybody. Everybody loves Nala. And, um, and my wife and I talk about how did we even know love before she came into our life? And so, but you know what? Um, She's going to die or we're going to die. One of the two, you know, one of them's going to go first. Uh, one of my favorite books is uh, um, Passionate Marriage by Dr. David Snarch. And in there, he says, in every relationship, somebody's going to get left. And when I read that, I felt liberated. I think a lot of people hear that and go, that's terrible. I don't want to ever be left. 
But, you know, that's even the basis of all Buddhism, of impermanence. There's manifesting and unmanifesting. It is the reality. Again, we're going to die, right? But we're going to die in this physical form. I don't know what continues on. But I do know that every atom in my body and your body existed at the Big Bang. So as you said, we are part of something that's much bigger than this human body and this human experience. So what is this human experience? Uh, you know, what, what is it we're supposed to do before we die? And maybe it is that, that we're supposed to love. And what happens, though, is because, you know, getting your heart broken hurts. It's, it's painful. It's physically and emotionally painful. When, when Nala, if Nala dies before I do, I'm going to be in pain. So what do I do? I get down on the floor with her every day. I, 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 I kind of rub heads against her forehead. I take her for a walk every morning, throw balls for her. You know, I give her lots of, I, I just love her every moment that she's here in my life. And she just loves back. And I think that's why we're here. Because if, if, if we keep guarding ourselves against that pain of heartbreak, which is what we all do, we never get to experience the goodies. We never get to experience how amazing it feels to have, you know, the love of another person, the love of a child, the love of a, of a dog, the love of a good friend, the love of a great meal. You know, if, 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 we're, if we're walled off to love, we're not going to experience any of those goodies. And, and who wants to go through life not experiencing the goodies? So if we're going to experience the goodies, if we're going to say yes to the goodies, we got to say yes to the reality that in every relationship, somebody's going to get left. You know, I, I, I've got a, a beautiful Mercedes SUV stored at my mom's house and I drive around. I bought it about three years ago. It's an older vehicle, 2007 uh, uh, ML63 AMG. It's the fastest, uh, biggest engine Mercedes ever put in an SUV. Beautiful car. And, you know, it may get wrecked. I may lose it. I'll be sad to lose it. My mother's 89 she, you know, I don't know, she outlived her husband and two of her kids, and she watched me almost die. So maybe she outlived all of us, right? But I expect she's going to pass away in not too many more years. And um, that's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. You know, I, I get up and visit her several times a year, you know, as often as I can. But it's going to hurt when she dies. So I just love her as much as I can now. So kind of my philosophy is this show up. You know, when I said, okay, yes, I'll do this interview with you. Am I tired from being on Zoom all week long? Yeah. But you know what? I'll show up and, and, and I'm going to be you know, all here. So I'm going to experience everything that this has to experience. I made a decision, so I'm all in. So that, that looking for love in all the wrong places. Most people that have an experience outside this human body, whether it's through psychedelics, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through new near-death experience, almost all use the same language. And that is, everything is love. Everything is love. That's, that's how most people come back, you know, from psilocybin, from LSD, from meditation, from plant medicine, from almost drowning. You know, I just felt just great peace and love. And so what happens when we're disconnected from that everything is love? We go looking for love. And usually what we do, we go looking for love outside of ourselves. It's out there somewhere. I got to go find love. And, and so that's where I get come up with the looking for love in all the wrong places. Outside of yourself is the wrong place. Now, because I, I work with men exclusively, you know, for many years I worked with couples, but since No More Mr. Nice Guy came out 20, 21, 22 years ago, my work's been pretty much all with men. And so men tend, you know, I work mostly with straight men, but not always, you know, so straight men go looking for love from women, gay guys go looking from it from, from other men. But we're looking for something outside of ourselves. And what if we are that thing that we're looking for? What is it? What if, if we are love itself? And then trying to look for it outside ourselves is always going to lead to disappointment. Well, you know, if we really boil down to it, everything is love. At least that's what people say that come back from these altered states that get out of the human body and the human mind long enough and come back to talk to us about it, um, that everything is love. So I'll go back back to a, a New Testament scripture when, when uh, a bunch of lawyers came to Jesus and said, give us the, the greatest law. Now, Jews, they, they, they got a lot of laws. They loved laws. I mean, they just buku buku laws. 
and you know and and you know and then all the different ways around those laws like even talk to any any faithful jewish person about the sabbath and you know there are whole books written on all the exceptions of how you can and can't observe the sabbath right so so the jewish people love laws and they came to jesus a jew said tell, tell us what is the greatest law and it was a trap they're trying to trap him and you know his answer was love god love god with all your heart mind and soul so it was love that was his answer love and they said the second law is just like the first one so it's the same he said love your neighbor as yourself and you know neighbor means anybody not you at least in this human form all right you know you're my neighbor you're not me you know and but basically what he said is yeah you you are me we we are one there is no separate self and there's no separate self between us and god he's not out there god is here your neighbor isn't out there your neighbor is here and so what he said i think boggles a lot of people and actually i grew up around a lot of christians and i'm not sure most of them ever figure this part out is that Jesus said the standard of all love is self-love. He said, love your neighbors all yourself, as yourself. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Okay, that love's all coming from self, right? So if the love of God begins with self and the love of neighbor is the same standard as self, why go looking for love out there, right? It's here. We, we need to find it within. And, and the thing that I tell people is that you can't love somebody more than you love yourself, it's just impossible. How could you do that, right? How could I teach you to juggle any better than I can juggle? I can't juggle, so that's going to be tough. The other piece is I can't let anybody love me more than I love myself. So if you try to love me more than, if, if I can only love myself a three on a scale of 10, and you want to love me at an eight, because that's your nature is to be so loving, I won't let you. I will put up enough walls and enough barricades and 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 hide and run, you know, because anything over a three, I, I, I can't accept because that's outside my, my own perception. So kind of going back to being here to get our hearts broken, because most of us are walking around thinking, well, at best, I'm a, I'm a three or four or five lovable. Many don't even, many are in the minus. I'm not lovable at all. I'm, I'm not. So what we do is because we're afraid of people finding out how unlovable we are as we're trying to get love. We armor up. Uh, Pima Chodron, a Buddhist monk, talks about this in her book, The, uh, the um, Wisdom of No Escape. It's a series of lectures. And she's very humorous about it. You know, our armors are different. Some have this big, tough leather armor, and it's, it's strapped on with cord. Some people, have, you know, there's zippers all over it, this protective armor that we've got. Um, you know, some might have, you know, this 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 kind of a knight's mail, the, you know, the the... the tough armor and then we got our offensive weapons you know, it might be a big sword or a lightsaber or or, 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 or a cerebic tongue or our ability to criticize and cut down and and so all the while we're looking for love we're armored up with our defensive you know protection to keep anybody from possibly hurting us and we got our offensive weaponry so if you're going to hurt me i'm gonna hurt you first kind of like from a leonard cohen song hallelujah all i learned from love is how to shoot somebody who outdrew you. I'm thinking that's what we learned from love. I, 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 yeah, if I look, if you look like you're going for your holster and your gun, your weapon, I'll shoot you first. That's love. That's how we're trying. So, so this whole thing, I'm going to go find someone to love me, and we don't believe we're even lovable, and so we're protected. So I'm not going to let you hurt me, and we have our weaponry. So I'm going to get you first if you try to get me, and we're trying to find love. I mean, is it starting to make sense why most of us have not really succeeded in that journey? So I'm a big believer of, of, of going inward. And, and one of the most powerful ways I've found to, to feel lovable is to, to honor myself, to take really good care of me, to take responsibility for getting my needs met, um, for, for being, for filling my bucket to overflowing. And then whatever, and that overflow is the love, the love how I can love God, how I can love my neighbor. You can't love God from an empty bucket. You can't love your neighbor from an empty bucket. You got to fill your own bucket. I, I know I'm mentioning a lot of books, but another one, Scott Peck's The Road Less Traveled. Uh, I'm told that's the all-time best-selling self-help book. And, and I realize I need to keep mentioning it more because most young interviewers I mention it to get a blank stare like they never heard of it. But it's the all-time best-selling you know, self-help book. So maybe there's a reason to check it out. So 
he talks in there that if a child has parents that are attentive to, 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 to their needs and respond to those needs, he says, in timely and judicious ways, I add consistent ways, the child internalizes an emotional belief, not an intellectual belief, but an emotional belief. I'm valuable. I'm lovable. My needs are important. And the world is like my family. So when I go out into the world, the world's going to be just like my parents were. All, ch all children believe that. So can you imagine going to your first day of school, of kindergarten, believing I'm valuable, I'm lovable, my needs are important, and kindergarten's going to, you know, you know, reinforce that. Kindergarten, they're all going to love me, and they're going to help me get my needs met. You imagine junior high, your first girlfriend, you know, coming into adulthood in your first job interview. You know, I'm lovable, I'm valuable. They all see that, and they want to help me get my needs met. Can you imagine how the world would unfold differently? If we were like that now of course most of us majority never had that kind of consistent experience as children and if you add one more to it if we didn't get our needs met in timely judicious consistent ways if you add if our parents used us in any way to meet their needs you know parentified us um you know I, for my father i played sports and so that gave him great value for my mother, I was different from my father, and I listened to her talk about her problems, so that gave me great value. That, when a child is used to meet the parents' needs, they also internalize another belief is that I'm not good enough. So, and the world's like my family. So most of us go to kindergarten, I'm not particularly lovable, my needs aren't important, and I'm not good enough, and kindergarten's going to be all about that. And then that's how we go about living our life. No wonder we're armored up. No wonder we got our weaponry. Right? So none of that changes until we can love ourselves. And so I'm a big believer in it. If, it, if that works for children, meeting their needs in consistent, timely, and judicious ways to give them a sense of that they are lovable, they're valuable, why wouldn't that work for adults? And I promise you, since I've really been highly paying attention to what are my needs, what are my wants, how can I take action to meet those needs and wants, how, I can, how can I surround myself with people who want to help me get my needs and wants met, um, I think I've become a much more loving person, much less critical, much less bitter, much less judgmental, um, less guarded, more generous. And, and so I, I think that's how we do the work of love. We begin loving ourselves and loving ourselves you know, with every ounce of power that we have. And, and then that begins to love outward. And then often that love gets reflected back. But when, we, when we're got an empty bucket and we're going to other empty buckets trying to get them to love us, we're just going to get a lot of rejections. And because they got their armor on and they got their weapons out too. And that's how we're trying to find love. So I don't know. Uh, it seems like there's, there's better ways than the way most of us do it based on pop songs, you know, movies and fairy tales. That's not how you find love. It's not some amazingly beautiful person you got a crush on out there. That's not love. One of the things that I find about myself, right? And it's not to do with love, but it's to do with, I guess, energy maybe, is I find that I'm like at my best self when I'm around other people. I, f I feel like I feed off other people, you know, um, yeah. for the last few years when I've been in Brazil, we haven't, I haven't really had that. So I, I've yeah. kind of like had to sort of almost generate that energy in other ways, but talking about like getting, I guess, energy from other people. One thing that's obviously popping up right now all around the world is, is men's groups. And, you know, you obviously have your own one is there's many, many other ones. And I almost think that's like, nature's way of responding to its surroundings in real time because of like the attack you almost see on masculinity and uh, toxic masculinity etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. i was just wondering from your perspective like what is the benefits of men's groups well, just tee it right up for me <laughs> I, I love talking about men's groups um let, let me back up just a little bit uh, back, I'm gonna I'm gonna digress in two different ways and then take a run at your question. One is one of the things I th I think can be really helpful for people is that you know there's some people listening to you go and you get your energy from people and they're going, oh, not that's not me, that's not me, and it's not because you know 
we probably have all heard the terms introvert and extrovert. And I think until I started understanding my basic, you know, basically how do I get my battery charged up? I, you can't get your own needs met. Yeah, and so I think you have to realize, are you fundamentally an emotional extrovert or emotional introvert? And that introverts doesn't mean you want to be alone all the time. And extroverts doesn't mean you want to be with people all the time. But what it means is if you're an extrovert, you're going to tend to get your battery charged being around people, being that social connection. An introvert is going to get their battery drained being around people. The introvert gets their battery charged in solitude, alone time. Right. The extrovert <laughs> goes crazy if they have to go be in solitude. Right. So if we can honor that and it's not black and white because I like to be around people as well. Like I said, when I went looking for a men's program, I knew I needed men in my life. I, I needed it to, to, to experience the love I want to experience, the connection, the inspiration. Um, I, I don't want to be alone all the time. Do, do I get recharged by having some good downtime? Yeah, I need it. I have to have it. I'm already looking at this weekend. When is my downtime <laughs> this weekend? Right, it comes after about 1.30 on Saturday. And I don't have don't have anything on my calendar until Tuesday. So I'm, ah, I get to recharge my batteries. I told my wife this morning, let's go to the beach Sunday. She goes, okay, so we're already planning on going to the beach. Right? Got to recharge. Now, but I also say that miracles happen around people. And so I tell like a lot of guys when I work with guys around dating, that you know, want a relationship and want a big life, but they never and leave their house and i go unless you got a living room full of people you're not going to experience many miracles and, and so like i've often said especially when i was you know a single guy living here in puerto vallarta i'd say i'd love waking up in the morning not knowing how my day is going to end mainly because i got out and got around a lot of people and then I, so i had adventures met people i didn't know even know in the morning and I had one client tell me one time he said robert you know when you say that that, that that's a great day when you wake up in the morning not knowing how it's going to end he goes for me that's pure hell and I go, what do you mean? He goes, oh, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want those adventures. I don't want all those people. I want to get up and have my day follow the exact plan I've laid out for it. Well, that's him, right? That's that, that he would be in hell just going out and having an adventure. I'd be in hell having my day laid out step by step by step and never deviate. But we're all different. But we have to honor that, I think, to fill our bucket, to get our needs met. So, and, and again, it's usually not black and white. We usually need some some of both in there. But again, it's honoring our, our own needs. All right, to your question about men's groups. When um when my when the publisher of No More Mr. Nice Guy sent me on a book tour, uh would have been early 2003. Sent me to several big cities across America, New York, Chicago, uh, went to Denver, San Francisco, LA. And um did did a lot of interviews, TV interviews, radio interviews, newspaper interviews. And um so this was in 2003, and um, a lot of the, a question I got from a lot of interviewers was, you know, because kind of no more Mr. Nice Guy was, you know, there's other books have been written for men, um, you know, Robert Bly's Iron John, uh, Michael Mead, um, you know, there's some other books out there, but most of them, you know, hadn't got you know big visibility like you know, like some of the more the bigger books, you know, for women. And so um, I think my publishers thought this might be one of those big books. It, it took some time to become one. Um, but so a lot of a lot of interviews said, Robert, did you see like a worldwide men's movement coming? And, and my answer was usually no, not really. Uh, for a couple of reasons, I said, I don't think there's one theme to draw men together like there was with feminism, kind of like, you know, equal rights and, and you know, things like that. And um, and I didn't usually say this to interviewers because I didn't know if you, know, you and I have a long form interview so we can explain things. They aren't just going to be, you know, a little sound bite put on a radio or newspaper. But I said, I think also feminism succeeded to the degree that it did because of good men. That good men recognized the inequality and, and the abuses and good men that were legislators, judges, university presidents. Good men in positions to make a difference started changing things, right? And so now feminism worked because good men, you know, in, if, if good men had not enabled it, you know, we probably would have either had a bloody revolution or feminism would have died out and we would have stayed with the patriarchal status quo. But good men saw the need for a change. 
And so I didn't, I, I didn't know if I'd have time to explain that. I don't know that there's some singular thing that men would rally around that the good women out there would support them in that. And, and I, I was wrong about some of my answers, but I was right about one thing. If you watch kind of now as men's empowerment starts to be more newsworthy, it's getting attacked by feminists and, and not just women, but feminist men that, you know, I keep I keep reading articles that liken masculine empowerment, men's groups, men's programs to like, you know, the, 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 the thing that went on January 6th, you know, the, following the election in the United States. They link that January 6th insurrection with you know, some guys going out and sitting on a rock and talking to God. Now that is, is, that's where it comes from. So it's amazing, you know, how, 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 how they'll scrape the barrel almost trying to find something to portray men's work as evil. I, I saw, I, I, I got a Google notice of an article in a Canadian newspaper. It was about a year ago, about six, six, eight months ago. And because it mentioned my book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. And, and it linked me with Robert Bly's Iron John, um, uh, with The Rational Male by Rolo Tomasi, um, I, I think um, The Game uh, by Neil Strauss, about, about six books. And it, and it just lumped us all together and said, these are all about traditional masculinity, you know, trying to tell men, you know, you know, and really only one of the books that it was listed even comes close to like kind of a traditional masculine role. And even it, I, I don't think it is, but even, and so this whole article, and it went on to say how, you know, studies have shown boys don't need fathers and that, cause it's, it's actually does great damage. Actually, there's more studies that show the damage that mothers do to, to their sons than fathers. But, you know, the, the article had such a bias and I just thought, okay, I guess I made the big time. I was lumped into it with a lot of really, you know, well-known books. And I go, okay, I'll take that. Uh, you know, he, he's obviously hasn't read my book, but you know, that, that, that's okay. So going back to the point, will there be help to help that worldwide men's movement? Probably not. Probably not. Resistance, if anything. But I, I, I was wrong when I said I don't think there'd be a worldwide men's movement. I actually think we are. I think we're in the midst of an amazing worldwide men's movement, but it doesn't probably yet look like it to the casual observer. Now, like I said, I work with men. So what I see happening with men is they are looking. You know, maybe they're looking for purpose. They're, they're, they're looking, but they don't know what they're looking for. They just know something's missing in their life. They know that maybe their job doesn't fulfill them like they think it should. You know, they're, 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 their partner, their wife, their girlfriend, their kids. And maybe, they, maybe they love them dearly, but they still feel unfulfilled. Something's missing. Um, you know, guys will go searching, you know, for it in, you know, television, drugs, pornography, you know, and we find, we, we go, this doesn't do it either. You know, it's not, it's not filling that hole. So what happens is they, 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 they go, whether they know it or not, they go looking. And what, what they seem to stumble onto is, you know, 12 step groups for, for alcohol. Uh, they go join a dojo and learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or karate or judo. Uh, they, they go join a, a men's support group at their church for men going through divorce. Um, they, they go find, you know, the yogic community, kind of the David Data type stuff. Um, they they read about men's groups and they go, where can I find? So they maybe even go to like a pickup boot camp to learn how to go pick up hot chicks. And, you know, it looks like, you know, what is Brazilian jiu-jitsu and men's divorce group and, they, you know, pickup boot camp, what do they got in common? And what they all have in common is community a connection with other men, grappling, you know, with other men, you know, surging with other men going out to, you know, do your day game and pick up women, talking to other men about the pain of the divorce you're, you're going through, you know, being on a, a bowling league, a softball team with other men and just relaxing and having a good time. And so what is happening, I do believe there's a worldwide men's movement. The internet is enabling that, but men are seeking community. And often what happens, they go get into a, a community with other men and some guy mentions, you know, my book, David Data's book, uh, John Wineland's book, you know, somebody, you know, or mentions this group that's meeting that are part of, uh, Mankind Project, you know, stuff all of a sudden. And now 
because of the internet spreading information, men go looking to, you know, to pick up chicks or learn how to grapple, and they end up finding a greater community of men. And I think that is happening as part of a worldwide men's movement. And so, so I think a couple of things are happening. One is men are finding tribe. We men, we evolved a million and a half years in tribe. You know, the men went out, hunted and gathered and fought, you know, brought the food and the furs back and fucked the women and got up and went and did it again. Right? That was a tribe that men had. They also had masculine initiation where the older men, the, the competent master of men took the young boys at age 10, 12, took them out, gave them a dance with death, supported them, helped them get comfortable, feeling uncomfortable, face their fear of death, and then initiated them into the scary world of the masculine and took them out of the nice, easy, cozy world of the feminine that where most men live nowadays. I call it the nursery. We just like hanging out, getting female approval, playing video games, watching Netflix, jerking off to porn, smoking dope. That's all that the easy world of the feminine because we don't have tribe and we've not been initiated. But that's happening. Uh, and men are getting, whether they know it or not, they're going to get initiated through their Brazilian jiu-jitsu and through their, their, their you know, going out with their buddies to, to pick up chicks. And, and are, are, some, are some of them maybe more effective <laughs> than others in connecting men with, in a conscious, open-hearted way? Yeah, of course. But often, once men get connected with men and see that, how amazing it is, they find the other avenues that maybe are more conscious-oriented, more open-heart-oriented. Um, and, and so... I see that happening. Now, something else I see happening is I think we swung to an extreme culturally. You know, we've had a few waves of feminism that basically the angry feminism went on the attack of men. My my the wave I grew up in as an adolescent and young adult was, you know, every man's a rapist and erection's a sign of aggression. You know, basically that men men were evil. And so I, I always likened feminism with men hating till many years later I talk with feminists and casual conversations. I said, why do feminists hate men? I don't hate men. I, I, I have a husband. I have a son. I love men. Well, how come, how come feminists always are attacking men? Oh, that was just a few angry, pissed off women. And I go, oh, you mean not all feminists, not all women were angry at men? No. And, and women, I say, I might get angry at a man every now and then, but I'm not, you know, just universally pissed off at men and think they're evil. So, but that, that's the message. And now this wave of feminism, you know, the whole hashtag Me Too, the talk of masculinity, you know, teaching in schools, there are no, there is no gender. It's just a social construct imposed on boys and girls. But the, the, the female gender is better. <laughs> you know, that, that is the message. Everything males, you know, I think we went from the extreme of, of maybe the, the abuses of patriarchy over to everything about patriarchy and men is evil and bad and needs to be destroyed and eliminated. I actually think, I don't think we're swinging back to a middle ground. I think we're actually rising to a higher level, to a higher plane where we don't, you know, where we don't have to live in this, the patriarchal world where there's an, where men own everything, you know, whether that's a manifestation of religion, colonialism, you know, abuse, uh, or we're not swinging the other way where everything men do is evil. I think men are moving more consciously and open heartedly into a different place. And I think that's changing the world. So you ask me why I believe in men's groups. I think that's how we're going to change the world. When I when I was down at, at Rhythmia two years ago, I said so it's a men's week there, and it, it was so much fun to just to be around with guys guys who were not into men's work. I found out most of the men there just happened to be there that week because it was a week they had available, not because it was a, a, a men's week. And so they kind of got some introduction even in, into men's work by me being there with them. But the final night, final ceremony, went from like 7 o'clock at night to like 9.30 the next morning. And uh, and in the morning, the shaman, uh, uh, who was actually Israeli by nature, but lives in Colombia, um, was doing a blessing for everybody. And I went up to get a blessing from him. And I didn't know he knew who I was, right? I, that I, didn't, I didn't know he knew I was like the guest speaker there or my importance. And, and he goes to give me a blessing. And, and he put his arm around me. He just pulled me in. And he said, what you're doing with the men here is so amazing because we have to start with the men if we're going to change the world. And he said, keep doing what you're doing. And he said, you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. And I still get tears in my eyes. I just, the, the brotherly love I felt from a man that I didn't even know him, you know, 12 hours earlier. And I didn't know he knew who I was. Just that if we're going to change the world, we're going to do it through the men. And, and so I love 
you know, when I see that there's men's groups all over the world, it makes me happy. When I started doing my men's work, you know, about all there was was, you know, the, kind of like the Robert Bly, Iron John. You go out in the woods with a talking stick and beat on a drum and say, oh, that's about all we had. I am so thrilled that you can't throw a dead cat without finding a men's group somewhere in a man's coach. Are some better than others? Yeah, of course. But will, will the best level the rest of them up? I, I do believe that. Are we creating amazing men? Yeah. Are we giving women a, a, a better choice of men? Not, 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 not the angry, controlling, you know, patriarchal male or, or the wussy, whatever you want, dear, you know, doormat. Yeah, we're giving women a choice of an integrated man, a man who's got his power, his fierceness, his open heart, who's been shedding his armor, who's dropped his swords. He's, he is love. He's bringing love to the world. And I think, I think the feminine, I think women of the world, they're already starting to eat this up. When I talk to women about the work I do with men, they say, can I come stand in your parking lot where you do your workshops? Will you put up a website so these guys that come to your programs, you know, I can find them? Women are craving this kind of masculinity. So that's my thoughts about men's groups. I think that's such a nice way of of putting it, you know, like we're, we're moving to this new plane and we're, you know, we're effectively raising the the level the standard the consciousness of who we are as men and actually really helping society in the process you know like uh, like you said through better choices um for women for families and um i think it once again it just comes back to like the true sort of evolution of nature you know following the path that it's meant to follow and we've done yeah. whatever we've done in the past and that was meant to happen because we had to realize those mistakes or it was just part of the process and now we're going like yeah. i said to that next a level cycle. yeah it's a cycle and um we don't have to keep repeating you know we don't have to swing back you know it's not a pendulum you know pendulums don't really change things they, they shake things up but a cycle lets things evolve in, into higher and higher forms so it's a cycle and so yeah we have to accept this part and this part to get to this part so that's quite a nice segue uh, talking about like, you know, giving women um, be better options. Uh, you do, however, hear women saying, we're all the nice guys, right? And you wrote a book <laughs> saying, no more, Mr. Nice Guy. I'm wondering if you're actually the problem that all the nice guys are missing. <laughs> no, I'm, only, I'm obviously only joking, but um, Seriously, well, you know, the, the, yeah. the title of the book is, you know, it, there's a paradox in the title. And, and, I, and I knew that when, when I named it that. My agent even said, Robert, maybe we should change the name. I go, non-negotiable. You know, then 20 years later, when the book is done, really was Robert. That was brilliant, the, the name. Because it's kind of, you know, we've all said, everybody, men, women, it's some, we've all, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Right? I've had enough, right? I'm going to draw the line. I'm setting a boundary. I'm speaking up, whatever. But then you see a book that says, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And I'm sure people have thought, why would somebody write a book teaching men to be not nice? Aren't there enough ni not nice men out there? You know, why do we need a book telling them how to be nice? Because, you know, most people are pretty black and white. If I'm saying no more Mr. Nice Guy, I must be teaching men to be assholes. That's the only possible thing I could be teaching. But, of course, I'm not. Uh, I'm teaching something very different. By far the best name you could have uh, chosen. I I've I've had a few friends that have written books and, like, they have given their books titles and I've literally said to them straight. So I'm like, that is the worst title you can use because <laughs> honestly, no one, there's so many books out there. You're not going to grab yeah. anyone's attention. This is your one opportunity, you know, yeah. on a, on a, in like a bookstore to stand out. So you, you oh, are there, a master bookstores out there. What's a bookstore? Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll be surprised. I, I, there's I, a I nice agree. When I, well, I talked to, I know, I know Barnes and Nobles is even coming back after filing for bankruptcy. Um, yeah, I, I I I coach men on that all the time. If you're gonna write a book, if you're gonna put any, if you're gonna put a podcast out there, you know, it better have a sexy title and a sexy vehicle, or people just go, I I, I got I got no time, you know. It's got to grab people's attention. So like I even asked you, I, I I can't pronounce ridiculously very well, but you know, what's a ridiculously human podcast? Well, you you got people asking a question already, so you got their attention. So it, mm. it pays to get people's attention. Yeah, exactly, right, exactly. So so what is nice guy syndrome then? 
Okay, this is usually where we begin. <laughs> so we'll, 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 this, this is one of those books where you get to the beginning in the middle of it. Um, so nice guy syndrome, and this applies to men and women both. Um, and, and basically it's a person who, at a, usually at a very early age, inaccurately internalized a belief, an emotional belief that says, I'm not okay, I'm not good enough. Kind of going back to what we're talking about that Scott Peck thing. Most of us inaccurately internalize a belief because my parents didn't pay attention, meet my needs in timely, judicious, and consistent ways, I'm not lovable. That's called toxic shame. And, and a toxic shame is an emotional belief. It's not an intellectual belief. We will start adding intellectual, we'll start adding words and, and evidence on top of the emotional belief. But the emotional belief is there's something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. Now, this is painful to feel like you're not good enough. There's something wrong with you. You're unlovable. So, what every every human being does to deal with toxic shame is they try to do things in the moment to try to diminish those feelings that they feel. Again, this begins usually in infancy. So, you know, some babies cry, some babies eat, some babies sleep, some babies put their thumb in their mouth. I sucked my thumb till I was in kindergarten. I think maybe I was dealing with uncomfortable emotions. I was. But this the way we try to cope with un uncomfortable emotions is with a very primitive brain. Right? The other thing that, that these young Infants, babies, children try to do is try to prevent the things that, that cause those uncomfortable emotions from happening again. So if I do this or don't do that, then I won't have this painful experience. Again, we're using a very primitive emotional brain, not a rational brain. But then we bring these two core things, trying to manage the uncomfortable emotions now and try to prevent them in the future. We bring that into adolescent where adolescence where they get, you know, uh, put on steroids with hormones get stronger, we come into adulthood, they're pretty well cemented into our personality. And so nice guy syndrome is just one of many ways to try to manage those uncomfortable feelings and try to prevent the things that causes those uncomfortable feelings. What a nice guy is doing is basically two things, trying to become what he or she, a nice girl, believes other people want them to be, to be liked and loved and get their needs met. You know, like if I came on this uh, interview with you and spent as a nice guy spent the entire time thinking what answer should I give him what will I say that'll make him nod his head just like that how will I know I'm doing it right you know there, there's no authenticity no integrity and probably going to be a pretty boring interview and I probably won't get asked to do very many more because it, it'd be you know just kind of a nice guy seduction and it's why when men use nice guy seduction on women why it usually doesn't work either it's boring when you're not your true authentic self but nice guys are not their true authentic self. They're chameleons. What do I have to become to get you to nod your head like that, like you approve of me and like me and, and want to be my friend or whatever the case may be? So that's the first thing nice guys do. Second thing is they try to hide anything about themselves that might get a negative reaction. So if I'm constantly going, oh, he kind of, he got that look when I said that. I better not bring that subject up again. Or, ooh, when, when I said fuck, he kind of got a look. I better not swear anymore. You know, I better hide. And the main thing that nice guys are hiding is their needs, their wants, and usually their sexuality. And, and so between trying to become something to get approval and validation, which will change moment to moment, depending the context of who we're with, and hide the things about us, we think my, there's no real us in there. Right. There's no, there's no, what do I want? What do I like? What do I want to do? You know, there's no, what is my truth? What do I believe in? What is my purpose? What is my, there's none of that. That's why nice guys very rarely have any sense of purpose about them. Not only that fear of, of taking a leap of faith, because it might be wrong. And what happens if I do something wrong? You know, oh no, that proves I'm not good enough. So, so, so that's the basic nice guys, that chameleon trying to manage our uncomfortable feelings, usually manage our shame, manage our anxiety by becoming, you know, what we what we need to become to get people to nod their head and hiding anything that, you know, that, that might get people to like, what, you know, squint, get mad, leave us, abuse us, call us names, whatever. Have you found that like nice guys have got sort of like, I don't know what the right way, maybe like worse nice guys um, in terms of like, uh, social media and stuff like that? Like, is, has that sort of like accentuated the problem? Because like now you are really being monitored, not monitored, but you know what I mean? Like you, it's really like things are out there. I, I am not a fan of social media. And, you know, I say that to almost everybody that interviews me and then they put the interview up on social media. 
Um, I, I, I do get that. Um, I'm not a fan for, for a few reasons. Um, you know, I remember years and years and years ago, 20, 25 years ago, some of my clients, Robert, you need to get on Facebook. You need to get on Facebook. Why do I need to be on Facebook? So people can write on your wall and send you messages. I go, can't they just send me an email? <laughs> you know, I check my email. I don't, I'm not going to go on Facebook to see if somebody sent me a message or wrote on my wall. So I've never really liked it. Just never been drawn to it. About the only value I've, I, that I've ever gotten in social media is like, like when I bought that Mercedes I told you about. I got on a, a Facebook group for people that had those kind of Mercedes. When I got an RV, I got on an RV group. So, you know, there's value in that. That's just people sharing information and, you know, and, and none of it, you're trying to get likes and, you know, sell you something. It's just people sharing a common interest. I'm okay with that. I, I, I like that. The other ways I've used it is I like YouTube because, you know, when I need to learn learn how to use my digital camera, I can go on YouTube and watch videos. When um when I need, you know, to figure out how this thing works on my RV, I can go find a YouTube, tells me, a YouTube video tells me how to do it. So I like that. Okay. I, but that's, that's, that's the information parts that I like of it. Where I see it with men, and a couple of times recently, you know, uh, in groups of men, like on on these ask me anything calls, um, I'll make the suggestion, um, get off social media for a month, completely get off, you know, your Instagram, you know, if you're on TikTok, most men won't admit to being on TikTok, but they probably are, um, you know, all those 12 year old Japanese girls dancing in their selfies and their underwear. Um, but as get off your Instagram and, and, you know, quit, quit watching videos that, that, that other than the ones you need to watch, to learn how to work your camera. Right. And every time I say that, Oh man, the deer in the headlight looks I get from guys. The men are just addicted to, to the social media. Now, a few problems I see with it. one is that, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are all stealing all of your personal data and selling it somewhere. I'm not a fan of that, but that's not my biggest complaint. Uh, my, my bigger complaints is that it creates a pseudo connection. Basically, social media creates constant dopamine hits to the brain. They give us the illusion that we have some something meaningful happening or some connection. And, and I've, I've been told that, you know, from a scientific point of view, that TikTok has mastered that better than any other platform. Just the, you know, just all the moving parts, the constant stuff coming up, the quick videos, the music, all of that, it just is constant one dopamine hit to the brain after another. And the reason that adolescents are there is adolescents love that dopamine hit to the brain. You know, if you look at most adolescent young men, they're out doing risky, dangerous stuff because it's just constant dopamine, right? And so it creates a pseudo connection that's not real. It's not really tribe. Now, I, I get that my program is virtual, but it's not just you, you know, sending messages back and forth. We have calls. We talk to people. We get in breakout rooms and you know, we can connect and we're building ways to actually connect people live in person. So that that's coming. Because I, I believe that's helpful. But I do believe we can use technology to connect. You, you and I, I think we've, this is a good connection. I like it. I'm going to talk to two of my best friends this afternoon on Zoom. So I'm grateful for that. You know, one lives in Santa Barbara. One lives in Los Angeles. I can't get on an airplane and go see them regularly. But we can connect. But, but the social media is just that, that little snippet of, of connection. The other thing that, that I think is not really good for men is that I say most, for the most part, Social media, the parts that we're talking about of getting the likes and, and, you know, looking at pretty Instagram models and all that stuff is highly feminizing. The, the, the way that kind of I break down masculine and feminine energies, the masculine does, it penetrates, penetrates the cosmos. It, it goes out and acts masterfully. The feminine is done too. The feminine is seeking to be filled with love and connection. And we all have a masculine feminine side and they, they have value to us. But what's happened culturally for a lot of men is we've kind of stayed more in, in that nursery that I'm talking about, the, the feminine part of ourselves. that challenge is frightening to us. Oh, I'd rather just, you know, play some more video games. I'll go I'll do my war, World of Warcraft till two in the morning. You know, I'll smoke some more dope. I'll watch some more Netflix. And there's no challenge. It's just we're, we're, we're being fed. It's pushed to us. Social media does the same thing. So not only is it constantly just feeding and pushing to us, there's no challenge. There's no challenge in doing this. Well, then we get on the dating apps. There's no challenge in doing that, but it's so easy to do and stuff just keeps getting pushed at us. That's where in our feminine state, 
And then when you link that to how many people liked me, how many people liked my post, how many people liked my page, how many people, how many followers do I have? That's all feminine. It's externally, feminine seeks external validation through attention, praise, and desire. Masculine is internally validated through masterful action. Now, again, we all have a masculine feminine side. Our feminine does need fed. Social media doesn't feed it. I call it junk food feminine. Going and sitting in nature and just letting your senses, that'll feed you. You know, loving on your dog, loving another human being, listening to good music, even relaxing with a nice glass of wine can really feed your feminine. But it, 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 but social media is, is, like I said, junk food feminine. And I've been asking men lately, how masterfully proactive do you find yourself putting a dent in the cosmos after spending time on social media? Do you get off social media and say, I'm ready to put a big fucking dent in the cosmos? No. You get, you get on social media and go, oh, a little bit longer. Oh, a little bit longer. You're not putting too many dents in the universe. You're just sitting there consuming, being fed pablum. So... I, you know, there's many things out there that, you know, I, I won't condemn them as inherently evil. I don't think pornography is inherently evil. You know, I think people can probably consciously enjoy pornography. I'm not really particularly into it, but, you know, usually it's usually the women in my life say, can we watch some pornography together? And I'm, yeah, sure. Let's watch some pornography together. And, you know, usually I'll find what turns them on. And if they're turned on, I get turned on by it. But, you know, so I don't think pornography is evil. I don't think social media is evil. Uh, I do think Mark Zuckerberg's evil. You know, I'm, I'm willing to say that publicly. Um, but when we get lost in it and it consumes us and doesn't feed our soul and doesn't move us forward in masculine ways, yeah, I, I think that's problematic and I think we need to address it. I think we really are like still in its infancy and and learning how to use it. and And most people because we're still using that kind of primitive brain, just like get totally lost in social media. And like you said, there's just the scrolling, the scrolling, the endless scrolling, and then like feeling purposeless and empty after you've like spent an hour just like watching 50,000 people's other lives doing whatever yeah. they're doing. And it, but, it, but I think there is a good way to use social media. Like you can, like you said, you know, you can learn so much if you are really disciplined and have almost like a plan. Unfortunately, I'm not a big believer in discipline. <laughs> if discipline, see, discipline, the very nature of discipline is that you're trying to do something that's not natural for you. Otherwise, you don't have to be disciplined. My wife goes to the gym two hours every day. And when I waved to her a little bit ago, she was on her way to the gym. It doesn't require for my wife, she doesn't have to have discipline to go to the gym. It comes naturally. For me to go to the gym requires discipline. And I still don't go near as much as she does. So discipline has been proven over and over and over again is not the best way to, to try to make any kind of significant change in life. So, so if you tell people, oh, let's just get disciplined about your porn use, just get disciplined about your, your social media use. I've not found anybody that's ever succeeded at it. You either get all the, the fuck all the way off it usually, or, or you stay stuck in it. Discipline rarely, rarely uh, does the trick. Um, but sorry to interrupt you on that. I'm just just not a fan of discipline. No, no, I, I totally, I totally get it. And I, I guess there's other ways to to maybe word it or term it, you know. Um, so, uh, but but yeah, just I mean, I actually took the last almost three years of social media, and I, and I recently got on probably about like six seven months ago, again, just because I was like, okay, cool, I've I've had the break that I needed. Not that I was yeah. ever like yeah. a, a scroller. I just used to love posting and sharing. I like I, I like shared so much, and then eventually I was like, hang on, why am I doing this? You know, and then, then, then I just stopped and then, you know, I, I came on again and, and have a different intention with, with how I use it, what I share, yeah. Yeah. you know, I'm like trying to help people. And I think, uh, you know, having that, that intention is maybe a, a better word than, than discipline, um, yeah. in terms of how you use something. And, and, and I agree. I, I have social media accounts yeah, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of kicking and, and, and fighting, you know, it, being drug into, you know, using social media to promote my businesses. So, you know, I, I, I see the value in them and I, and I will use them, but yeah, what I do see is, is so many people, men and women, both just getting consumed, you know, everybody I know, everywhere I go, I watch them. They're all on their phones. What are they all doing? 
you know, my, my, my stepson, 18, his 18 year old girlfriend, they'll be sitting side by side in our living room. You know, they both live here in the house and, you know, they're, they're always on their phones, just, you know, just watching videos, just watch, you know, just what they're, they're side by side, you know, nobody even watches television in my house anymore. They're all on their phones. And you think almost television almost would seem like a unifying factor because at least we all sit in the same place and watch the same thing together, but nobody even ever turns the television on because they're all on, on, on their phones. Um, so it, it, it is, it's, it's, it has consumed us. And, and the reason it has is it gives that illusion of connection, the dopamine hits. And again, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, we're all going to be wearing these lenses. I mean, Google's going that direction. Apple's going that direction. It's not just Zuckerberg, but he's the one that's put the most money into how can we take, I mean, even change the name of his company to Meta, you know, let's go away from reality into Meta, you know, so it's about how do we leave reality behind? Um, and, you know, I don't know where all that's going to turn out. I, I, I think at some point people will basically just say, I don't need this in my life. I, I don't I don't really see social media becoming a thing we use in moderation. I think it'll be a thing that consumes people or people just completely remove. And again, I've never made that prediction out loud before. But that's my sense because social media is is... is is it's a battle for our hearts and souls. It really is. That's 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 what makes these people billionaires that 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 run the social media programs. Is is it if they can take over our minds and our bodies and our, our behaviors, they win. And and it's their intention. You know, they want more shares. They want more money. They want a, more more bodies, more eyes, more hearts, more souls. And and again, I think it'll either consume people or that people start treating it like a drug. That you know. I'm going to go to 12 steps, you know, social media anonymous. I don't know. It probably already exists. But I, I think we're going to hear a lot more about it. I think that makes your work like more important, you know, and, and a, a voice like yours more important. And we almost need to use the, the tool of the devil, so to speak. To, I'm okay with that. To spread uh, our, our I, messages. I will spread this word on social media. I'm, I'm okay with that. And, you know, um, yeah, we, we, we can use it. And I think there's actually a nice renaissance happening, to be honest with you. Like people are learning more stuff because of the availability of information. We're learning about like, how did people used to do things in the past? Like, you know, what did our grandparents do? What did they eat? Um, how did they socialize, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So like, you know, things like homesteading and uh, homeschooling and, and all these things are enjoying a renaissance now, which is, which is once again for me, but it's just, nature's way of sorting itself out to be honest we can fight as much as we want but nature's going to sort it sort everything out for us i i, I truly believe that I, I i heard george carlin say one time I, I saw him live not too long before he died and he said you know we don't need to worry about mother nature the mother nature is going to shake us off like a dog shakes off fleas and, you know it, we're not that important you know i'll throw out one more piece you know well, so you know since i'm being a little bit contrary I, I have a lot of brilliant young men in my life. My, my son's 38, just smart young man. And just, I know, because I'm, I'm, I'm around so many men's programs and men's coaches, a lot of smart young men. And I agree with you. Like I said, I, I like that I can go on the internet and get tools and information for, for whatever I want. But I'm also beginning to see another pattern in men, like my son's age, that grew up on the internet, right? Just, re I mean, they have better educations than I have. And I've got a PhD. They just, they, they can go get information. You don't have to go to a university anymore to get information. It's there. But now what I'm also finding is men that become, that's all they are now is consumers of information. They're brilliant. But, you know, they're, they're on, they're listening to every Uberman Lab, you know, podcast. They can tell you, you know, about fasting. They can tell you about cold plunges. They can tell you about, you know, and, and they can go into like the, the, the DNA of stuff and the bulletproof and how to live to 150. They're just brilliant and they're miserable because they're not doing anything in life. They're consuming information. And I, and again, I respect that. I like being around smart people, but I have to tell guys, you know, take a break for a little bit. You have enough information to live a really good life. You know, I'll tell guys, quit reading self-help books. You've got, you, you probably, the last one you read probably gave you enough information to go out and make significant changes in your life. 
and and I and I and that's a piece I've been seeing a, a lot with men, not just young men, but especially young men that grew up on the internet. I have to tell them, take a break from information gathering for a while. It's been a little. I I, I got a client that every time I talk to him, he, he's actually lives in South Africa. Um, every time I talk to him, he he talk to me about a different book that he'd read, and he has not. And every every time I talk to him, he has a different thing now spinning in his head. That now he's trying to apply that to his relationship struggles, and then the next time it's a different book, and he's trying to apply that to his relationship struggles. And, and I said, pick a book, pick one, and just you know, just just run with whatever you pick the one you think that has the best information, and just run with that. And and, and it's funny the same the same client. Uh, I, I did an interview on psych hacks last week and it just came out a couple of days ago and he sends me a message. Oh, how cool you're on psych hacks. So I'm going, this is the guy that just can't quit consuming information. And every time I talk to him, he's in a different crisis because he's applying a different approach to his relationship. So I love information. You know, I, I, I love being around smart people, but, but again, when this stuff is so easy to have it just to sit and consume, we, 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 it's easy to lose track. It's easy to lose track that the reason we're consuming the information is to apply it to our life, not just to be smarter and know more stuff that you can post on your Instagram page, right? It, it really is. How does it make a difference in your life? And, and so um, I, don't, I don't really have an answer for that other than just be the noticer, be the observer do you spend more time listening to pod? I don't, guys will tell me all the podcasts they listen to. I don't know how men listen to so many podcasts. I really don't. There's a lot of good ones out there. I don't know how they do it. You know, I, I'm too busy working to have time to listen to a lot of podcasts. But so can you take what you learn and now go out and apply it today? Do you consciously go apply that principle in one very conscious way in your life? And then, then go get some more information, but then go apply it. Do you think people, it doesn't just have to be men, are fearful of making a change that will actually help them get better? Yeah, that's that's why I've, I've been employed my entire life, because that's what I help people do. That's why people go to therapists and go to coaches, um, probably for two reasons. Well, maybe at least two. One is they don't know how to make the change. You know, uh, most of us, you know, uh, Einstein said you can't solve a problem using the same logic that created the problem, okay? Most of us just keep going back to the, our paradigms, those roadmaps that we got in infancy and thinking it should work. It should work. I saw it's the only roadmap I got. We don't know that there's different roadmaps. So part of the problem is lack of, lack of good information. We often need better information. But then the other part is it's just that, that unknown. I don't know what's on the other side. That's where we usually need support. We need somebody that's either taken those kind of leaps and got to the other side and said, look, it's worked out well, or here's what I learned. Here's what the struggle taught me. So, or we just need support. Say, so you can do it. I'm here for you. I'm cheering you on. You know, you, you, so that's often what we need is just some, some better information to help us make different decisions, different paths of, of action. And then some kind of support system that, you know, that's either going to hold our hand walk by our side, tie a rope around our waist and hold on to it while we dive in, whatever whatever it is, it's easier to make changes that way. Trying to make a change. Because like, I wanted to move to Mexico for years. And, you know, for about 10 years, I kept saying, I want to move to Mexico, I want to move to Mexico. But, you know, just wanting didn't, didn't get me down here. And, but when I, you know, several things actually moved me in the direction of me. I just realized I saw other people moving to Mexico and having success at it, they were doing well. So a buddy of mine did it. I go, if you can do it, I can do it. And so that inspired me that it could be done. What's on the other side of that? So I, I did it in little pieces, little bites, and you know, got down here, found out I could do it, and kept coming longer, staying longer, and got married and bought a house down here. So, but I wanted to do it for about ten years. So yeah, having the information to help you and having people at your side to support you seemed to be essential for a lot of us. To, unless we're just natural adventure. You know, some people are just naturally adventurous. Oh, cool. Another new adventure. I'm in. It takes me, somebody says, Robert, you want to go have this adventure? I go, if you lead, I'll follow. I'm in. I'm not the one leading the way for the new adventures. But that's just me. And, and so it, it helps have somebody at, at your side. Just going back a little bit to what you were saying just now, like I think um, something that, that people almost forget or don't even realize, like, 
and you know like guys and girls is that we are actually made to do things right we are the only creatures on planet earth that have like opposable fingers you know you have the thumb and your index fingers that can actually grab stuff and do things right no other creature has that you know what i mean but we've we've almost like lost our thought process or understanding of what it means to kind of be human and do things and take action and uh you know you'll sit on your keyboard and you know type or play games or yeah. uh, i don't know you're on your mouse or whatever it is however you move move your things around on your computer but we st we've stopped like making things you know we we've stopped like doing woodwork and i don't know like um sewing and and all these things and i feel like you know like there's so much purpose in doing that and um yeah. we should we should encourage people like that that read all these books or that are stuck in that constant healing sort of i uh, must go and do more healing and i must go and do that we must like okay cool stop take a step back like i said get off social media start making something start using your hands like your that. you know what i mean well you know i i was thinking um i i was in a a coffee shop oh it's been 15 20 years ago and there's a kind of a young guy you know kind of dressed a little different than me but sitting there in this coffee shop just consumed in a book that he was reading and I sat down near him and I said, what are you reading? And he said, oh, it's a book by uh, 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 Mel Brooks' son. It's called uh, World War Z, WWZ. I go, oh, really? What's it about? Well, it's about the, uh, the after effect of the zombie apocalypse. I, I actually never did see the movie with Brad Pitt in it, but I got the book and read it. And, and there's a part in that book where basically the economy and value of jobs in the economy was reversed to where like the executive types you know, the, the people that can be at the computer, moving finances, making this, ha you know, making decisions, all this were completely useless. They had no value. They couldn't get anything done. They had no basic skills. And it was the blue collar people that could, you know, fix a diesel engine, that they could, you know, change a tire, that they could plant, you know, a crop. They could hire you know, the people that actually had those doing skills were the highly valued people in the new economy after the apocalypse. And so talk about nature, you know, maybe, you know, of course it's, you know, when, when people write about like zombies and stuff like that, they're actually, you know, there's always a metaphor for, you know, other, other social things that they're trying to address. Um, but yeah, it, it maybe wouldn't hurt us if things got turned a little bit upside down and the people that could actually grow their own food and, you know, raise an animal that you know that they they have the the survival skill and ability that many of the rest of us go well, what do i do now you know how do i eat where do i get my food so um and 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 i and i agree with you you know when i talk about the masculine you, you know loves challenge and loves the doing um the masculine part of ourselves really does like that physical part the challenge of learning something new of doing something of 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 accomplishing something and seeing it come to fruition and go, I did that. You know, I, 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 I even though I don't love painting houses, I, I as a kid, I, I painted my room, I painted my parents' house, I made money, you know, in high school, college, I painted enough of my own houses. And, you know, I always just, what I love the most about it, it's kind of is pretty re repetitious, tedious work, but then you step back and look and go, that looks good. I did that. Oh, I'm so glad I did that because it looks so good. That's a good feeling, you know, and maybe maybe most of us don't get that feeling very often nowadays. It's that sense of achievement, you know. It it could be, like you said, doing the painting. It could be mowing the lawn, you know, even, I don't know, cleaning your kitchen or, or something. Like mm -hmm. that sense of achievement is so powerful. Uh, you just don't get it in in the modern world because people are distracted on 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 social media. But but yeah. you know it's available to you every single day. You know even if you can just do a few of these. You know what what someone said: stack the one percenters. You know like do a few of those a day just to kind of start balancing out. You know your your yeah. kind of online digital purposeless world. So I, I I love that. Yeah, I've I've got two guitars sitting right here on my side on guitar stands. So it's a guild jazz guitar that I bought after my divorce 20 something years ago. I'm going to, I'm going to learn to play. I, I, I played guitar as a kid and, and, you know, 
uh, it stayed in its case for years, but I, I took it out of his case. And then a buddy of mine about six, eight months ago gave me a Gibson Les Paul. Beautiful Les Paul guitar. I was always wanted either a Stratocaster or a Les Paul. Now I've got a Les Paul, and you know, they both sit there. And you know, I have good intentions, and and but I have created an intention that I'm gonna learn to play 12 bar blues. That's it. I'm not I have no intention. I gotta be able to entertain anybody, you know, be good at it. But I thought if I can learn to play both the rhythm and lead of 12 bar blues, that's an accomplishment. And it and it's 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 a structured pattern of playing music so it, 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 it can be it can be learned and, and but you know and, and i've downloaded a few videos but you know again i get so caught up in work and caught up in this and and you know listening to you it, it, it does inspire me that you know i would feel accomplished even if i just watched one video and got a little better at playing a chord progression of 12 bar i it would feel good to go hmm, i can do that better than than i could before and it's, it's that that's that internal validation. Nobody has to hear it. Nobody has to say, good job, Robert. Nobody has to say, I'm proud of you. I feel good because I pushed myself out of my comfort zone, did something I couldn't do before. I got better at it. I, I feel masterful. You definitely have that look. Although you might need to grow your beard a little bit bigger, like you know, um, <laughs> you've got that blues look, right? So, um, okay, get, uh, get that ZZ top look, you know, going on. Exactly, exactly. So, look, I mean, there's, I've got like fifty things here I wanted to speak to you about, and I've just had such a great conversation with you and I. There's no ways we're going to get through through some of this stuff, and you, you've spoken about this uh, in, uh, you know, in length uh, to to many other great. Uh, podcast hosts so i really encourage other people to to go and listen to those shows because there's really is a lot of value um yeah, go get on social media and listen to yeah. all the things i have to say about social media exactly like just ignore I, everything I we love, said about i do it. love irony i love irony <laughs> exactly exactly um just uh just before we kind of like um finish off i was just kind of wondering uh what is it that you are kind of like most excited about in the future? What have you got uh, coming up that uh, you'd like people to know about? Well, I've, I've, you know, got the product placement of integration nation, you know, that, that, that is the big piece. Um, you know, when, when, when I first decided to, to, to do this men's membership program, I'd actually been in, entertaining the idea of, of at least maybe semi-retirement. I mean, not quitting working, but you know, I've got this RV, I could go travel more and, uh, you know, take my Elon Musk satellite dish with me and, you know, stay connected. And um, so I took about three months off I'm coming up, actually coming up on three years ago, uh, this summer, took three months off, no interviews, uh, no clients. And just, you know, I did spend some time in the RV, you know, spent more time with family and really, and really enjoy it. Felt good. And I thought, well, there's some things I still want to do. I want to convert my courses into video. And so I, I'm going to do that. I can probably do that in a few months. It took about a year and a half to do it. And then that somebody suggested build a membership program. I was already in the process of working with my tech guy to convert my thousands of hours of content I've created into to, to uh, transcribe it, have it searchable, and and then use a my 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 tech guy. We could even use AI on it. Yeah, when AI gets here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a real good prognosticator. It's here. It's changing everything. Um, but then about a year and a half ago, you know, I'd already, you know, it was really kind of diving into Integration Nation. We hadn't launched it yet. It just hit me that I, I can't do this and entertain the idea of semi-retirement sometime down the road. And I just said, fuck it. I'm in it for 20 years. So my, my mom's still alive at 88. I'm 68. So I, eh, I got 20 years left. You know, that's my fate. That's my fate. So that's what I'm going to be doing for the next 20 years is building and, and talking about integration nation. So when you ask what's coming up that excites me, it's that. If you ask me that a year from now, five years from now, I'll probably say, oh, let me tell you about integration nation. Cause, uh, cause I'm all in and I, I want every man on the planet who wants community to be able to have community whether it's this community your community somebody else's community so somebody said yesterday oh robert you know i was i was in a community that's one of your competitors and i go i don't have any competitors i go we're all on the same team we're we're we're, we're all working for the same prize 
and it's not competition. And I said, I, I, there's probably about 3 billion men on this planet who need community. That's a pretty big pie. I think we can share that pretty well. And we can even overlap because all the better guys get, you know, just, you know, a good hybrid of stuff. So our work's cut out for us. There's a lot of men out there that need community. And I'm assuming that's my fate. And I'm assuming um, I got 20 more years to do that. So that's, that's, what's, that's what's in front of me. Well, you're looking great for, for 68. And, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you are massively inspiring guys uh, in, your, in your community. And I really look forward to, you know, seeing you around all these, these next 20 years. And yeah, I'll just we'll keep was, bumping into each, into each of other. Course, right. Of course, of course. Maybe the goatee get a little, little bit longer. <laughs> and um, if people want to sort of get hold of you or, or in touch with you or find out more about uh, what you do, where's the best place? Two best places would be drglover.com. That's a D-R-G-L-O-V-E-R.com or uh, integrationnation.net. Um, go either place. We're actually rebuilding drglover.com. It's a, a little bit messy uh, right now, but it's intention to kind of get that up and it works. You can find everything you want there. It's just, uh, it, it could look better. So we're working on that part right now, but, and then check out integrationnation.net. And my last question for you is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? First thing that came to mind is not giving too many fucks. Um, you know, blurting, acting on impulse, saying yes, walking through those open doors. Dr. Glover, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure having you on uh, my podcast today. Uh, I've got sure, a challenge for you. you. Um, maybe like in six months time, we we do a round two and we we pick up a, a lot of the stuff that we kind of missed out. But Did for, I leave anything out? <laughs> for, 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 for the beginning of, of the next show, uh, we, we need to have you doing a, some sort of rendition, a, a blues rendition, so you can uh -oh. have a uh -oh. challenge of now... Uh, doing that practice every single day and, and, and using those beautiful guitars that you have there. Oh, you're, you're evil. You're evil. Uh, <laughs> all right. I, I, I welcome the challenge. I welcome I, the challenge. But you're amazing. still an evil man. <laughs> um, but I just really wanted to say, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Like you, you really are changing the world and, uh, the way you view things is, is like on a different level. And I, I really encourage, uh, guys to, uh, to go and listen to you, uh, to go and listen to all your, your, your chats and, um, you know, uh, Dr. Glover has been doing this for such a long time. Um, he has a lot of wisdom to share and, um, it's just, it's just been such a pleasure to chat to you. So thank you for your time. Garrett, thanks for the invitation. And, and, uh, I'll accept that next one. And, uh, I welcome the challenge. <laughs>